This is Life's Tough, but Explorers are Tougher. I'm your host, Richard Weiss. I love the outdoors. I always have, and I always will. I've heard stories that would make the hair on the back of your neck stand up. Explorers are the type of people who walk in space, go to the bottom of the ocean, and stand on the highest summits. Scratch the surface of any explorer and you'll find they're all storytellers. This show is about their tales. America is a country of immigrants. And if you go back to the first Native Americans, they have a story most likely coming over the Bering Strait to Alaska. My grandparents came from Europe. Everybody has a story. But our guest today, David Good, well, his story starts deep in the Venezuelan rainforest. David, welcome to Life is Tough, but Explorers are Tougher. So I mentioned that your story really starts before you were born uh, in the Venezuelan rainforest. How did that happen? Yeah, so, you know, for every story, there's a backstory, an origin story, I guess you could say. Um, and it really begins with my mom and my dad. Um, and, you know, I, I, could, I could tell this from my perspective, you know, coming from, from my end here, but, you know, there's another sort of side of the story from the jungles. But basically, it began in the 70s when my dad, as a PhD student at Penn State University, uh, was tasked to go down to Yanomami territory deep in the Venezuelan Amazon rainforest to to study uh, the Yanomami people, more specifically to measure protein intake and how that's related to uh, intervillage warfare. Um, so he's kind of caught between two opposing you know, arguments in the anthropological field. But um, under Napoleon Chagnon, uh, he went down to a particular community known as Hasapue or Hasapueteri. And the reason why these Yanomami people were very sort of in the spotlight of anthropological and sociological research and um, is that they're one of the world's last relatively indigenous um, societies that still adhere to that traditional hunter-gathering, semi-nomadicism, simple horticulture lifestyle, and have very limited to no contact with the outside world. So um, just to set the context, because um, first of all, the pronunciation, and correct me if I'm wrong, it's Yano Mani or Mana, right? So you can, yeah, it's it's different. So um, in the international phonetic system, the ya no ma mi, but the I is usually cross out I or an umlaut O, so ya no ma mu, but uh, we don't really have that in our English um, alphabet. So it could be ya no ma mi, ya no ma mo, ya no ma ma. So I, 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 I say ya no ma mi. <laughs> okay, so when you say traditional hunter-gatherer, I've seen traditional hunter-gatherers even in North America. So just to give us the context of what these people look like, how different they are from, say, Americans, from, from you and I, is, is this a group of people when your father went there that had seen very little or had very little contact with the outside world? Just set up the village picture. Sure, sure. And that segues into, I'm about to tell you uh, about my mom. <laughs> so as I described this, I'm telling you about my mother. Um, so the Yanomami are um, a group uh, um, of lowland Amazonians that uh, wear, during my father's time, you know, didn't really wear any clothing, you know, that, that they had the traditional penis string, um, you know, they made little grass skirts and um, uh, to cover their private parts, but they were just, they were, they didn't have any clothes and they were barefoot. They hunted with the bow and arrow. Um, they they uh, cultivated plantains, which is a staple crop. And in my dad's, you know, research, uh, he concluded that roughly 85% of their dietary intakes from plantains. Um, and they live in a communal roundhouse structure with thatch roof, but opening in the middle. And anywhere from 50 to 150 to 200 people can live in a single place. So that's your, you know, your aunts and your uncles and brothers and sisters, they all live in the same, same village. And everything that you, they need to survive is extracted from the surrounding rainforest. Um, and my father, uh, you know, these are stories he passed down in my childhood, told me about, you know, um, experiences where he's visited villages where they have never seen, you know, the white, the white man, you know, and they thought he was some kind of spirit that descended from the heavens. And my, one of my favorite stories was uh, um, they had questioned my father's mortality. They didn't know if he was an immortal or not. So they were kind of playing around with the idea of shooting him with, with several arrows to see if he 
would live. <laughs> but um, but so this is sort of the backdrop of you know the the society that my mom grew in. They 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 didn't have a counting system that went beyond two. It was mahu uh, porakapu and pruka one two and many and that's it. That's their counting system. No, there was no written language. There's no calendar. Life is just very linear. There's no compartmentalization of time. And, 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 and when you wake up, the first thing you think about is how am I going to get food for the day? You know, and, um, you know, some anthropologists have classified them as the luxury, they, they're in the luxury class because they only have to work three to six hours a day <laughs> and to, to get what they need to survive. Um, so that is the type of society or the, the um, experience that my father um, was thrusted in, um, in, in the 19, mid 1970s. And for him, it was a huge culture shock, but it did not take him long to fall in love with that way of life. And so when you say that way of life, even the spirit system, uh, I think it's shamanism is, is probably pervasive. The spirits of, of the, the rainforest. Sure. Yeah. Kind of, um, more specifically, you could say animism, you know, as, as a form, as form of their spiritualism. Yeah. All right, so th there's a little bit of a, a love story I'm assuming here because here you have young anthropologists taking notes, very earnest. People think he's a living God. How did your mother enter into this picture? Yeah, so, um, you know, my mom was just, she was very young when she very first just uh, saw my father. And again, she was just like any other Yanomami who saw my dad for the first time, this kind of, you know, tall looking, you know, pale skinned person who could not speak the language. So um, uh, uh, they, they had a term ghost tongue, right? And it's something they would call someone that, that could not speak and they couldn't understand why my father could not speak Yanomami because if you think about it, they didn't know what was beyond their tropical borders. So they thought, you know, my mom thought the whole world was the Amazon jungle. But he eventually, uh, what was supposed to be about a 15 month research program ended up being 12 years in the jungle over the span of 12 years. And during that time, he learned the language and he didn't have a Yanomami dictionary. He didn't have any of these like linguistic, you know, publications he could, you know, bank off of. He'd learned it through complete immersion. And so it took him years. And not only did he learn the language, but the, the, the people trusted him and loved him and, and they adopted him. And then one day a headman of the village said, you know, you're a Yanomami just like us. And just like any other Yanomami, it's unnatural, you know, unnatural to not have a wife. So he said, uh, you should have a wife. And of course, my dad thought this would be an impossible, you know, kind of um, uh, endeavor. But eventually he agreed. And uh, Yadima, my mother, uh, was betrothed to my dad. And then over the years, they had a friendship. And eventually when uh, that friendship cultivated into a romance and they married according to Yanomami customs. Yeah. OK, so how do you and your two siblings happen? Are you, are you, I think you told me once you were conceived in the jungle and in, in the Amazonian jungle. Sure, sure, yeah. So I was, and um, and when my, my, my you know, in Yanomami culture, when you get married, like <laughs> when, you, when you tie the knot, you take your hammock and you hang it next to your partner. Like that's official. That's like the official sign you're married. So my dad, you know, hanged his hammock next to my mom. And then of course, uh, laughingly uh, or jokingly, if you want to divorce your wife, you just uh, you just untie your hammock and you walk away, and that's it. You're done. <laughs> but um, no, so they, they their hammocks were tied together, and um, and I was uh, conceived in the rainforest. And um, but of course, just like uh, just like my mom showed him her world of the Yanomami, he wanted to show her his world of New Jersey, Pennsylvania. So um, naturally, he invited her to come up and. Uh, and then uh, uh, soon she, she was pregnant with me. And then about several weeks when she arrived in Philadelphia at the train station, uh, that's when she had me. In, in, and, in and, your, um, and so for your mother, I mean, you're coming out of a, 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 a jungle, a jungle in which you're barefoot, not wearing very many clothes. Uh, you, you stay high too if you see somebody, mm -hmm. and she ends up in New Jersey. And and I know there's a lot of New Jersey jokes that could be <laughs> made, but you know New Jersey could be a cultural shock for anybody. <laughs> so what is what, what is your mother saying, uh, or, or at least relaying about this experience? Yeah, and um, you know of course these are these are stories that I've been told as a child, and and um, but. Uh, <laughs> she described, for example, uh, I think New York City, like uh, a colony of ants. That's the only way she could relate, 
you know, the, this mass of people just going by each other, not, not looking at each other, just kind of like, you know, unaware of the, the human, you know, close, you know, the proximity of other humans next to you, but they're just going right by. And she saw that as a very strange way of living. So she can only assume they're just like ants, you know, coughing, going back and forth. And, and that was very hard for her because you can imagine, you know, a society where you knew everybody. And then when you, when another villager came from, you know, from another village visited, you, you, you stop, you talk, you figure out their background, where they're from, how you're doing. Um, and that you don't have that in this impersonal kind of world here. And that was pretty tough. Now, on top of that, now imagine you can't speak to anybody. <laughs> no one speaks, you, you can't get Google Translator to translate Yanomami into English. So the only other person she could speak to was my dad, you know, thank God. <laughs> and, um, and so it was very difficult. I think, I think for me, you know, and these are my opinions here, for mom who was the master of the rainforest, right? She's the master of the domain. She can gut an animal, animal cultivate plantains, do all these things. And then you go to New Jersey and she, she can't even, she, what are socks? Like, what are socks to her? Like, she can't even, what are these strange things, you know? Um, how do you go to the bathroom? It was such a huge culture shock, this idea that this device on the ground just like eats your feces, you know? It was so strange. Um, and some of the culture shock, it, it is comical in retrospect, but, you know, I could imagine how scary it was riding in an airplane for the first time. You know, my dad shared a story where somebody had turned on a Jeep and she thought it was an animal, you know, ready to pounce on her. So she, she booked it and ran behind a bush <laughs> and hid. So uh, talk about culture shock to the extreme. And was there any going back and forth at that point uh, from when she first came to the U.S. to going back to uh, South America? Oh, absolutely. You know, my father's dream was never to actually live permanently in the U.S. And he, his dream was to, to get a place in Puerto Ayacucho in Venezuela, which is in the Amazon state of Venezuela. So he was able to coordinate, you know, for, for the first five years of my life, we went back and forth, back and forth. And um, and we had to, he had two more kids. I have a younger brother and a younger sister. So we became this uh, intercultural family, you know, uh, where we traversed the jungles of the Amazon to, to the streets of Rutherford, New Jersey in the Meadowlands. Um, and I think over the years, mom, mom, you know, she was patient at first, but I think after a while she said she just, she just couldn't do it. She just, it was enough for her. And when you say enough for her, what did that mean for you? So, you know, as a five-year-old, it's interesting because I remember being five, right? And uh, I remember speaking, you know, I was speaking Yanomami to my mom. I was, to me, she was just like any other mom. I didn't really, I wasn't very aware of this strangeness or differentness about being, being half Amazonian. Um, but, uh, you know, to me, she was just mom. And then one day uh, in 92, um, and, you know, it's a very long story, but she decided that uh, she, <laughs> she cannot go back to New Jersey. She said, not one more day. <laughs> um, and unfortunately, she made a very hard decision to separate from the family, and uh, she remained in the jungle, and I and my siblings remained up here in the U.S., and that would be the last time I'd see her uh, for 20 years. And that's I mean, I as a five-year-old, I mean, having kids myself, the idea of being separated at five, you're very conscious of your mother. Mm -hmm. I mean, that's probably the most important person that had to have an effect on you. She's down there. Mm -hmm. What did you, how did you rationalize or what was the excuse of where your mother was? Sure, sure. And, and, and I know it's only natural to sort of look at this through the lens of being, you know, whatever culture you're from, because some people ask, how could a mother leave her kids? But unless you actually understand the details in Yanomami culture, it's really hard to wrap your head around it. But for me as a five-year-old, we were, we had traveled so much that I didn't realize, you know, mom was gone forever. Um, to me, it was just like, oh, okay, yeah, mom's in the jungle. We'll, we'll figure it all out, right? Because we're so accustomed to this such such crazy lifestyle. But it wasn't until, you know, and obviously my dad didn't say, hey, mom decided never to come back, you know, be with you guys. So uh, it month after month, year after year, when I was around six, seven, eight, that's when I started realizing, oh my gosh, I I really lost my mom. Like she's gone, and. Um, it, it was very painful for me. You know, I loved my mom and I remember I'm the oldest, so I have a lot more memories and it, it was very heartbreaking for me to lose her. And not only did I lose her, uh, I didn't know why. 
you know, I didn't know the nuances of Yadamama culture and this, you know, uh, craziness of our family. I was just a kid that lost his mom. And, uh, and unfortunately, you know, I didn't know how to cope with it as a six and seven year old. So I kind of internalized her leaving as abandonment. And for most of my life in my adolescence and younger twenties, I had this kind of um, hatred towards her, you know, for leaving me, for, for, for not being there for me growing up. Did any of your friends ever ask you where, where's, where's mom? <laughs> yeah, well, you know, uh, my dad, he's an anthropologist, so he used to take us to the American Anthropological Association every year, those annual meetings, and I hated it because we were kind of a, we were kind of um, a phenomenon. We were, we, we were kind of, I felt like I was entertainment for all these other, you know, anthropologists, half Yanomami, half, you know, the son of Yadima, son of Kenneth Good. And they were very insensitive to my emotions and my feelings. I'm not saying all of them, I'm saying a lot of them. So I really, you know, um, did not enjoy those, enjoy those, those moments, um, you know, going to those meetings. Um, so, uh, yeah, I, I'm, I'm sorry, Richard, I lost your original question. Yeah, no, no, I think you answered it. But um, there's a story that you told me once that you were like a lot of other kids in New Jersey, or I, I'm from Long Island, oh. you, and you go to the American <laughs> Museum of Natural History. And yeah, so, so had a particular class field trip that was a little bit of an eye opener for you. Yeah, so yeah, thank you for reminding me. Yeah, so um, I growing up, I just wanted to, I I um, renounced my Yanomami heritage. I didn't want to have anything to do with Yanomami because even as a young child, and I remember thinking of this that why should I be proud to be Yanomami when my connection to that heritage is my mother who left me and abandoned me. So I said, you know what? I'm going to be Italian. <laughs> <laughs> you look Italian. Yeah, exactly. I am quarter Italian. My grandmother came over from Italy when she was in the 20s. And so I decided, you know what? No, I'm an Italian American. I'm not Yanomami. So nobody questioned that really. Um, you know, so either Italian or Mexican or some kind of, you know, I, I, nobody questioned. I said, I'll take that over Yanomami. So, but I couldn't hide from it. And that's what I was trying to get at. I'll never forget when I was in third grade, I walked into my social studies class. And we had the Scholastic Journal for Kids. It's sort of like monthly, you know, four or five page, you know. And uh, I'm flipping through it in social studies class and bam, there's a picture of me and my uncle shooting a bow and arrow. And I'm just thinking, holy crap, you know, I'm, I'm trying to create a new identity. I'm trying to tell everyone I'm Italian and, <laughs> and I'm trying to forget my Yanomami heritage. And here it is, a picture of me, my entire class of my peers, and sub cat, you know, the caption says Yanomami boy learning to shoot a bow and arrow. And I'm like, holy crap, that's me. So I was sweating bullets. And, um, and, and so those kind of moments carried on through my lifetime. When I got older, we took a field trip to the American Museum of Natural History at the South American and we ventured our way to South American Hall. And I remember hanging with my kids and I'm just a typical 10, 11 year old kid, just, you know, um, always getting into mischief, you know, teasing the girls, stuff like that. And then I was, I stopped dead in my tracks when I looked up and there's a big portrait of my mother <laughs> just staring right at me. At the American um, Museum of Natural History. At the History. American Museum of Natural History. And there's hundreds of people everywhere, all, you know, passing by just watching this. And I'm like, holy crap. And I'm thinking, this is a nightmare, you know? And all yeah, I want to do your mother is, look like in that picture? There's gotta be, there's a picture, right? Yeah, yeah. So uh, the, the, like? the captions say Yanomami woman, right? So she was adorned with a down white down feathers in her in her hair. She had the McCall, you know, feathers in her in her shoulders. She was painted. She had sticks through her. So she had rodent sticks through her nasal septum in her lips. And and I'm thinking, you know, and for me, you know, I was always I was always jealous of my friends' moms because they looked like quote unquote regular moms that took them to soccer practice and made them PB and J's. And I'm like, what is my mom doing? Oh, she's she's putting sticks in her noses and she's eating tarantulas and bugs in the rainforest. So as as a as a as a 11 and 12 year old, I did not want to get picked on by my friends. So so anyway, that that was um, that. And there's so many more of those kind of instances that occur throughout my life where I felt like I couldn't hide from it. But I think the most the, what I could not hide from definitively is that every morning when I woke up and I looked into the mirror, I saw my mother's eyes, I saw my mother's, you know, features, and it's something, you know, where at first I felt like I can't hide from my skin, and that's that battle I had well into my 20s. So your, your dad's a uh, professor, so you obviously have, quote, smart genes, good student, <laughs> bad student. No, I mean, you know, most professors, their kids tend to be pretty smart, too. What kind of student were you? 
Um, so I was a very, I was a very good student. Um, and I think a lot of it had to do with this sort of identity that I was trying to create for myself. Um, I was, uh, um, so I was, a. uh, uh I was a baseball player. I was a straight A student. I mean, I was a paper boy. I couldn't, I, I was trying to get as Americana as I could get. And um, I was in the honor society. You know, I was, uh, I was doing very well, excelled in like biology and mathematics, but because of my internal struggle and, and the issues that I had with my identity crisis in high school, I, I just, my, my grades you know, plummeted and I was just dealing with so many panic attacks and and, and depression and so on. So, I mean, I was a bright student, but I was a very damaged, damaged young man. So you're now, you're right in the middle of getting your PhD. So clearly something changed <laughs> along that journey because a PhD is not an easy thing. Sure, sure. And much of that journey is described in my book, The Way Around. Um, but I went through this sort of phase of, you know, being this damaged child. And then in my late teens and early twenties, I was, um, uh, you know, in deep depression, I resorted to alcohol to, you know, kind of ameliorate some of my, my, my internal struggles and, and the pain that I was feeling. So, uh, when I was 16, 17, you know, I, I dropped out of high school. I, I might've been the only student in the honor society that dropped out of high school, <laughs> but I, I couldn't, I couldn't handle the pressure. Right, the pressure of the of the high school setting, um, and um, I was I had some troubles with authority too, but uh, I eventually I dropped out and and I got my GRE and I went to community college at Northampton Community College nearby, um, and I graduated there, moved on to got my bachelor's and master's, and, uh, I, and and you know a lot of things have happened since my master's, but now I'm I'm embarking on my next uh, stage of my academic career to to uh, for my PhD. I, I mean, were you ever curious about going back to see your mother growing up <laughs> yeah at what point um because i know that your father wrote a book called um into the heart and um you ended up going back to see your mother yeah so i was around 22 21 22 i was in a very very dark part of my life and i was in a position i i had to make a decision and the decisions were very clear either i continue this dark path and um, probably won't be alive much longer. Or I go back 20 years to the roots of, you know, what's causing all of this and, and, and find out what is it that, you know, what's that pain? And I know it goes back to my mom leaving me. And I decided to make that leap of faith and, and confront that. So I, I read my dad's book. I, I started learning about Yanomami culture through various ethnographies and articles. And what was interesting is that the more I got to learn more about them, the more I felt like I was learning about myself and my mother. And, you know, and so you fast forward a couple of years, I'm going through this healing phase and I had some very good people around me. And I decided that, um, that I forgave my mom. I don't really know if she needed my forgiving considering the circumstances, but, you know, uh, forgiveness can be a bit altru you know, altruistic and, you know, or it could, you know, or it could be more for yourself. So when I forgave mom, um, that's when I started healing. And that's when I, at 24 years old or 23, I said, well, it's time, right? I, I'm, I'm now, it's time for me to go and, and reunite with my mom and, and, and pick up where we left off. And so, <laughs> I mean, there's right. a, oh yeah, and? <laughs> and, right. Um, so at 24 years old, I finally graduated my bachelor's and, you know, I was that typical, typical broke college kid. I, I, had, a, I had a one book bag, about a tube of Neospor and a couple of Band-Aids and some duct tape and, and and that's pretty much what all the tools that I had and the uh, the joke in the family is that I, I have this um, very very deep sense of fear for bugs so my my sister was so concerned it's like David she took me aside David you know I know you're afraid of a ladybug David um, how are you going to survive the Amazon <laughs> but uh, there was a lot of things I did not speak Spanish I didn't speak Yanomami I haven't seen my mom in 20 years I was afraid of bugs and I don't know a thing about surviving in the jungle but I, I compartmentalize all my fears and focus on the one task at hand and that is finding my mother and so I, I embarked on that trip uh, in 2011 book a ticket to Venezuela I met up with some contacts and um, began my journey to find my mom and so did you find her yeah, yeah. So uh, I had I was um, 
under the wing of Hortensia Caballero, who's an anthropologist at, um, at the Venezuela Institute for Scientific Research. And she had been studying the Yanomami for 30 years and she knows that area and she knows my mom. So she helped me pretty much lay the path to my mom. And I'll never forget going on the, the speedboat up the Orinoco River and the, you know, the sultry air, the, the temperature, the sting of the mosquito, the bite of the gnats, the color of the foliage, the, 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 the touch of the water. I, I, to me, it, it re, I realized that, wait a minute, I'm not like some foreigner going to some crazy unknown land. Like this is my home. I'm actually going back home. And I felt like this is, I felt so much at peace and at home with this journey that um, I, I, you know, it's like this sort of like genetic, I don't know, like it's DNA memory, I guess you could say, you know? And we, it was quite a, quite an adventure. You know, we, we have to fly into Caracas and you go from Caracas to Puerto Ayacucho and then a bus ride to San Mariapo and then a three day boat ride up the Orinoco River. And then you got to cross the Guajaripo Rapids which are infamous for capsizing boats and, 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 and very dangerous. And then once we get up there, you don't know where she is because the Yanomami are semi-nomadic. They never stay in one spot. So you literally have to find her. I have to find her every time I visit her. So we speak to the villagers, right? When we get closer and closer. And finally, we got to the village of Hasapue. And, you know, everyone, everyone runs to the bank because they can hear that outboard motor, right? They scream, motor, motor. And everybody runs and they want to see who's here. And, and we explain to them that David David, you know, son of Yadima is here. And there was, everyone was just, just so excited. And, and, and they told me, get out of the boat, get out of the boat. We want to touch you. We want to see you. So I got out of the boat. I was just swarmed by Yanomami. I mean, they had hands down my pants, up my shirt. They were <laughs> tug, tug, pulling my nose, touching my ears. And there was, you know, like 10, 12 Yanomami just speaking very, very, uh, you know, uh, <laughs> very loud, very excited. And I didn't understand a word they were saying. Well, what are you so thinking? I, was, I mean, are you excited? Are you afraid? I mean, what's the. Well, you know, culture shock too, right? So, like, you know, being, you know, <laughs> You can go to like France and not speak French and you can get culture shocked by like just having like eating at a French McDonald's, right? But this for me was like, oh my gosh, you know, hunter gatherer people, they're not naked. And I'm just like, well, you know, I've never been around so many topless women before. So, you know, and, 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 you know, as they were, what, what I realized as they were <laughs> touching me and feeling my beard, cause they don't have, they don't have beards like I do. And, but when I looked into their eyes and I realized, wow, this isn't just like, you know, the experience of an anthropologist being in a different culture in a hunter-gatherer society. Like, this is my family. These are my aunts. These are my uncles. These are my nieces, my nephews. This is my blood. So for me, that was such a surreal moment. I was just, I was, yeah, I was in shock, but I was also in awe and so happy to be with, you know, my, and, meet my people for the first time. All right. So is your mother still alive? So she was away foraging and um, they said that uh, uh, somebody went out to the forest. They say, well, you stay here, you know, pitch your hammock. You stay here. We'll go out to the forest and go get her. So I'm sitting, sitting in my hammock. And <laughs> again, about an hour and a half passes by of them just like hands all over my body and, and touching my beard. Then in comes my mother, Yarima. And then the whole entire village was just quiet. And you can hear whispers of, you know, and punctuated with my mom's you know, name, Yarima. And I stood up and she was wearing that uh, strap over her head, carrying a basket of manioc. And, you know, she placed the basket down. She, she walked towards me, I walked towards her. And I'm thinking, oh crap, what do I, I don't speak Yanomami. I don't know what to say. You know, I, for me, I had envisioned this like chariots of fire moment where we just like run up to each other and hug each other and- Slow motion. The other mommy don't, they don't hug like that, right? So I, I walked up to her and I didn't know what to say. I didn't know what to do. And so I just, all I could do is put my hand on her shoulder. And I looked at her and I said, you know, mom, it's me, David, you know, I'm home. And, and she, I could tell when her eyes widened when I said the word mom, because she remembered that word mom. And of course she was shaking, you know, um, crying. And obviously I, I kind of, I, when I touched her shoulder, I was just immediately flooded with all these memories of going to the roller coasters, um, going to the fairs, going to the mom, wrestling and playing with her, watching music videos with her, just like having a mom and then, and then not having her for 20 years. And then finally I realized, you know, I don't care why she left. 
she's here, you know? Who cares what happened 20 years ago? She's alive, I'm alive, let's start a new relationship. And we just cried and held each other for like two hours. And um, I was so, it was very emotional and I was so happy to be with mom again. You know, it's interesting because the worlds are separated so far away, yet there seems to be very universal feelings, right? I mean, you looked into her eyes, there's a connection, you don't speak the same language, but yet you know that her heart is beating, that a, a look of love may be in her eyes. I mean, is there some sort of lesson or what did you learn at that moment? So many things, yeah. Um, you know, I, I, was at, uh, I was at peace, you know, I was reconciliation with what happened and, um, you know, I, came, I went from completing hating my heritage to, to being proud of being Yanomami, wanting to know everything about Yanomami society. And yes, there are universal elements of love and family, separation, you know, even death and dying and, and, and reunion and all those things. And it goes to show, I, I mean, the story that I like to, to, to say is that, you know, a mom's a mom, no matter what, you know, and, and you know, whether, whether she, uh, uh, he, whether she's from the U.S. society, you know, and, and puts warm socks on or tucks you in a bed at night or, you know, gives you some 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 medicine when you have a cough or whether she is a Yano mommy and uh, prepares a fresh wad of tobacco for you or, you know, or guts a piranha fish so you can so you can eat it or or, um, <laughs> you know, uh, you know, mom's a mom, no matter what, from what from what, no matter for what culture, what society you're from. So there's that there's that this unique mother son you know love and bond um and you know and i felt it and i experienced it and and how long did you stay there then um i stayed there for there's a first trip in 2011 um i stayed there i was in the amazon for over for about three three and a half months you know i did a lot of traveling visiting different villages because i wanted to i wanted to get to know you know more about yanomami culture you know yanomami in my family, Yanomami that are near missionaries, Yanomami that are in the, you know, near, you know, more urbanized settings. So I traveled around quite a bit, but uh, yeah, I made, I made uh, over the course of three, three and a half months, I was in the Amazon. And, and how, how was it departing from your mother? Yeah, well, one of, one of the things I realized, um, and I'll never forget, there was a Catholic Salesian nun, Sor Antonieta, and she's, you know, she took me in at the mission and, and took care of me. And uh, uh, she passed away recently, but she said that I, I could do something in one day that could take an outsider, like my dad, years to do. And that's to gain the trust of the Yanomami. And because I am Yanomami, I didn't know what that meant at the time. I do know now, but I realized that I needed, I am, a, I am the only person in my community, other than my siblings, a Yanomami that has been born and raised in Western society, educated in Western society. So I'm aware of, I am, aware of Western society in which in ways that my Yanomami family don't or are not aware of. And um, so I decided that I needed to come back and get more training. You know, I needed to, to do something. And I didn't know what it was at the time, but I knew my heart was there. And that's why I, I found, started a foundation, the, the Good Project, a, a nonprofit that's dedicated to supporting Yanomami programs in Venezuela. And when you say support, um, I would imagine like so many other um, what they'd say indigenous people, is that the correct term? Mm. That their lifestyle, their lands uh, are very vulnerable to uh, mining, outside influences, all of those things. So is that part of the good project? Yeah, so w one thing that we're, uh, we have a challenge is, is telling the world who the Yanomami are. And I know I have this very unique um, circumstances, position, right? To articulate who the Yanomami are, but I am also a Yanomami. Um, you know, I could show you a video or some, what we could consider ethnographic footage of a naked Yanomami woman that's, you know, chopping down plantains and bringing it back to the village. And I could say, oh, by the way, that's my mom, you know? <laughs> so um, I have that unique, I, and I recognize that. Um, and so we want to show the world the, the unique, culture of the Yanomami uh, through my eyes, you know, as a son, as a brother. But we also want to show the world that the Yanomami aren't sort of this, 
they're not all this homogenized, you know, single people. They're very diverse, right? In, in levels of contact with the outside world and in terms of histories, right? The histories of Yanomami people in Venezuela are very different than in Brazil. The histories of the Yanomami people in Parima are very different in Alto Orinoco or, or other regions. So that is one thing that we're trying to do. And those differences also are in their challenges. Some are dealing with illegal gold miners a lot of them are, unfortunately, that are coming in from Brazil into Venezuela and, and some mining in Venezuela that's in conflict with Yanomami communities. And these mining camps, they're, they're, they're poisoning the waters, you know, direct violent conflicts with the Yanomami. They are a, a deep threat to the Yanomami people. They bring diseases and increase the incidence of malaria. So that's one aspect. Um, uh, so health, right? So the other, the other is, is um, working with Yanomami programs in Venezuela that recognize that these communities that have had sustained Western contact since the 50s and 60s, they need the tools to be able to engage with the world stage, right? Both economically and politically. And so they have established intercultural bilingual schools, which were run by the Salesian missions. And they train the Yanomami how to read and write uh, math, both in Spanish and in Yanomami. Um, and they're a big part of, you know, give, helping the Yanomami uh, become self-sufficient, developing agency, you know, or supporting agency of self-determination, um, because the Yanomami today aren't the same Yanomamis in the 60s and 70s. They're on the world stage, you know, and they, in order to, to interact with political functionaries, you know, uh, medics, um, introduce diseases, they need, they need training and knowledge. So to circle back, the big thing with the Good Project is that we support those existing programs down there. Two, um, we raise awareness by sharing Yanomami culture, uh, specifically through my family. Um, and then of course, three and more recently is to engage in research that, um, especially dealing with the Yanomami microbiome and the gut microbiome, um, that uh, I believe is a big part of an element of protecting their way of life. Now, just go back to that last subject, because that's a topic that's just really coming in the consciousness of people is the bacteria in their gut. And one would assume that everybody is a gut is a gut is a gut, but that's not the case. That is not the case. And when you talk about, you know, discovering your heritage, I didn't know back in 2011 that I would be in the thrust of this. And I did not know that this is the basis of my, you know, that this will be the basis of my PhD research. Um, but yeah, my research will be involved in characterizing studying the gut microbiome of the Yanomami people. And, you know, uh, uh, it's obvious that the subjects are going to be my mom, my family. Um, so to kind of quick recap, you know, the Yanomami through their way of life, where they they have a very active lifestyle. They live communally. Everything is shared. Um, they're, they live in the environment, right? They sleep outdoors. They have such a diverse diet. They don't have access or limited access or no access to antibiotics. They don't practice extreme sanitation practices. So um, in short, that, that means that they have a very diverse gut microbiome. And when you compare that to the microbiome of uh, urbanized industrialized societies, you know, we blow them out of the water. Sorry, we, I mean, the Yanomami blow them out of the water in terms of gut microbiodiversity. And we now know that a, what we call, um, you know, a disturbed gut, let's just say, you know, there's various ways to describe it, but we know that in this society, we are being ravaged by auto-inflammatory uh, auto conditions uh, and chronic disease states like, like diabetes, IBD, Crohn's, arthritis. And we know that all of these people that suffer from these terrible diseases uh, have a, a, a lower diversity of gut microbes. And where you look at the Yanomami, the diversity is off the charts. And uh, we'll be, you know, we are prepping a manuscript to publish our initial data. And- um, Is that so what your PhD is in? Uh, my PhD will be characterizing and studying the, the gut, yeah, the gut microbiome, yeah. Um, and especially as it's, uh, uh, when you look at their food systems and their diet. Um, so I about, we're just about out of sure. time. So, you know, obviously there are many attributes that you're very proud of when you look at your heritage or even the lifestyle in which they live. So here's sort of like the point counterpoint. When you meet someone from down there, what do you tell them, like, what's the best <laughs> thing about growing up in New Jersey or being American that, you know, you're proud to say, and conversely, when you talk to Americans like myself, you'll say, 
wow, I'm so proud of this aspect. There's got to be good <laughs> and bad from each society, right? Yeah, there is good and bad. Um, the Yanomami don't ask those kind of questions. So those kind of conversations come up when I show them pictures and they love it, right? So I'll show them a picture of New York City and they're just, you know, you hear them, mm, you know, they're all very, they click their tongues in amazement and, um, and I'll show them pictures of, of family here. Um, and they love seeing pictures of animals like horses <laughs> and, and cows that you've never seen in their entire lives. Um, so, you know, that, that is something amazing. I never, never really come across a Yanomami that wanted to like really get to know this world more, except for my brother, who was, uh, who was very, you know, passionate about uh, um, learning more and wanting to visit here. So um, I don't, I don't, just like my mom, she says she doesn't talk about this world when she's down there. Like, what's the point? How can she explain snow? How can she explain cars, right? I mean, the people don't count the two, right? So, or past two. So how do you explain all these things to them? And it's easier just, just to not talk about it, right? Um, so, uh, but here in the US, when I talk about the Yanomami people, of course, when I talk about them, I miss my mom so, so much. Like, I can't wait to get back. But I, it's, it's trying to describe a feeling of this kind of whole, being, feeling whole when you're in the jungle. Yeah, okay, sure. There's mosquitoes, you know, uh, there's, there's- Have you there's got all no pet fear? Have you got yeah, no Yeah, right? <laughs> but, you know, but you're there with your family and you do everything together. You got to go fishing. You, you, you always go with a band, right? We're, we're, we're bands of, you know, you, you want to go collect some plantains, you do it with, and you have fun while you're doing it. I don't experience stress. I don't experience loneliness. I don't experience anxiety. You know, my blood pressure, and I've measured this, my blood pressure goes way down. <laughs> uh, and, you know, the food that we eat is so pure. Um, and I am, I feel absolutely wholeheartedly happy, you know, in the midst. Yeah, I've had malaria. Yeah, I've had, I've got swept in the rapids. I've had all those things, but I've never felt unhappy in the jungle. And not that I'm unhappy here, but this world is tough. I mean, tough, the stress levels of this society is, is super tough. So um, that's, that's, you know, how I would explain between the two. I was raised and educated and socialized in this world. So I don't think I could live a world one without baseball. I'm a Phillies fan. I mean, I got to meet... <laughs> I met Bobby Abreu when I was 14. And I'm I was a like, Yankees fan. <laughs> yeah, so I love baseball. I love, I love science, biology. So not being able to, you know, connect to the most up-to-date journals and articles and books, especially on microbiome, would be, would be um, awful for me. So that, that, that would be the tough about living forever in the jungle. <laughs> yeah, but without going on a, a limb and sort of to sure. wrap this up, I mean, what you're describing is what a lot of people have said has gone wrong with uh, modern society is that mm -hmm. families have moved further and further away. Whereas, you know, traditionally, whether you're in Europe or Asia or in Africa, you had a village, the village were your, your uncle, your cousin, your, you know, your, your grandmother, your grandfather, I mean, all be on the same street. So everybody, no one felt lonely because there was always somebody who knew you. And I, I think that's part of that descriptive. And I think that's very universal. I agree. And it's missing here. My mom saw it for sure. That's why she got out. <laughs> and um, as I get older, I have kids. I have a six-year-old and a three-year-old. And, you know, and I, I see it too. And it makes me sad, you know, when I see my friends and peers and how, especially with their relationships with their moms and their dads. And, and it's not, obviously, it's, I'm not trying to generalize here or like homogenize all, all, all Americans, but you do notice that there tends to be a pattern of such, such um, individualism where families seem to be part separated. You, you know, I, I see it with, with my peers. I don't see that among the Yanomami. And, you know, and I see, so I see people just become so upset or feeling so empty about some of the most trivial things. And I think they're trying to fill it with things that don't matter really, you know, that are so, so ephemeral. You know, who cares about the flashiest phone? Who cares about, you know, what rims you have on your car? Who cares about, you know, all these things? And you know what? My family, they don't have clothes. They, they sleep in bark hammocks. They're barefoot. Uh, you know, they, they eat piranhas and, and they have to shoot with a bow and arrow. But I'm telling you, never are they unhappy, you know? So. And David, so if people want to learn more about The Good Project, is it thegoodproject.com? 
Yeah, thank you. Yeah, so um, jointhegoodproject.org is org. where you can, yeah, so we're, I am planning a return expedition in 2022. And just like every other, you know, expedition and, and field research, we need to raise the funds. So I would appreciate if you could come check out our, check out our stories, check out our um, reports on jointhegoodproject.org. Um, if you can, please make a, a donation. Every little bit helps. Um, so that's the nonprofit side of it. Uh, if you want a little bit more of like my personal, you know, you don't want to get in a little mind of David Good, go to davidgoodamazon.com. And that's where I have my YouTube channel, my blogs. Um, you can get a copy of my book there. So I recommend those two websites for sure. David, you know, I've often said that um, explorers are storytellers and that's the tradition. And I have heard a lot of great stories, but your story, Matt, that is a great story. So David Good, thank you very much for being on Life's Tough, but Explorers are Tougher. Thank you so much for having me. Appreciate it.